As the official healthcare provider of Minnesota United, Alina Health is focused on keeping our loons in top condition. And with expertise in orthopedics, sports medicine, heart care, and more, Alina has the team to keep your family in the game too. The experts at Alina Health take the time to get to know you as a whole person, helping you achieve wellness for your mind, body, and spirit. It's an altogether better kind of healthcare. Learn more at alinahealth.org. Everybody and welcome back to another episode of Sound of the Loons presented by Alina Health. This time I get to be joined by two additional greats from UW-Milwaukee. We'll get to talk about that because amongst the many things and many titles that the both of you have, Manny Lagos and Tony Sana, we were joined by Khaled last week, who is also a UWM alum. But now I get to be joined by two of the legends in Minnesota. So thank you both for taking the time. I know you're both insanely busy. We were just going over sort of random things, pickleball, life, not playing soccer anymore so we don't get hurt. But both of you, how are you? Happy New Year. We're already into February. How are you guys doing? Our pickleball game is pretty good. Um, <laughs> Manny's ducking me. But other than that, we're doing great. Uh, doing well. I'm I'm trying to figure out this this crazy winter. I don't think I've ever seen a winter without snow and, and this kind of warmth. So a little bit out of sorts as a Minnesotan and, and what to do with myself, but overall doing really well. And Manny is the chief development officer and senior technical advisor. We want to make sure we get that right. We call you the Renaissance man. That's really what you're known around the halls of Minnesota United. Tony Sana, of course, the President, founder, CEO, all Mr. Everything of the Sana Foundation, doing all sorts of good over there. So um, I want to talk to you guys both about sort of your your history in Minnesota soccer, because we've been able to talk several times now about where Minnesota United is at now, what soccer looked like when you both started and grew up in this state and where it is today and sort of the the different iterations along the way. But Want to talk, talk to you first, Tony. When you look at growing up here, your lifetime in, in Minnesota and the sort of the soccer in the beginning, soccer through high school, you went away to college, you played on the national team, and now Minnesota United, Allianz Field, and what you've been able to see. What what do you make of it? How do you summarize that? You yeah, well, it's just been cool to see, you know, not only in this, you know, the state, but in this country. So um, you know, and I think for some people, it, it may have been Groundhog Day, um, you know, seeing the evolution of soccer. But I think right now it's definitely, you know, embedded in our infrastructure and, and here to stay. And, you know, we're it's definitely different um, the way kids are, are, are growing up. And um, it's hard to say, like, is our perspective different just because we're older? Um, but, uh, you know, social media, the access to soccer around the world. Um, but also just having the resources and being able to watch the highest level of talent, you know, in person here is is a lot different. Manny, would you agree with that assessment? You and I have gotten to talk about soccer in this state and, and this country quite a bit. Um, yeah, 1000 percent. I, 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 you know, it's surreal for me, Kendra, to be on this podcast with with, with Tony and I who have grown up playing soccer, dreaming of of being involved in the sport uh initially just because we loved it so much and wanted to play as much as we could and wanted to be around each other and just kind of within the ecosystem of Minnesota. Um, and then certainly the trajectory of our careers and, and having the, you know, ability to play professionally for so long and, and in our own way, um, you know, really feel fulfilled as, as pro soccer players. Um, and then now to come back and, and certainly for me, it's an honor to have someone like Tony on, on the United podcast because you, you have this arc of commitment to soccer on so many levels from so many people, not just us, just so many people. Um, and then you have uh, the ability now of the soccer to become more relevant. And you have something like where Tony just creates a spark of investment in the community through soccer, but not really about soccer, really about 
you know, impacting and, and using soccer and then using sports and then using our great community to create this amazing foundation. Um, it's just inspirational. You know, it really is. And I, I think in some ways yet at United, we're still young in terms of creating our impact in the community. And certainly our stadium and our team does it. And certainly we have some great partnership opportunities with Tony. I really think we'll have more in the future, but it's just really an honor to kind of be on a podcast with him uh, and shared so many good memories and continue to kind of have these moments where we get to kind of talk about our journey and also talk about soccer in Minnesota. Tony, I want you to explain to people listening what your foundation does and shame on them if they've never heard of it, never been a part of it, never been to something that the, the Sana Foundation is a part of. But can you do, explain to people what it does, how it does it, and is this something that you knew you always wanted to do? Well, um, it's grown a lot. You know, it's a it's a youth development and real holistic organization. It started around soccer, and I realized that, um, you know, soccer helped me, but it was really the relationships, you know, like Manny's parents and our other families. And, and so I built an organization around where I could develop relationship with kids. And then it grew to their caregivers. So today, you know, our largest program is really mentors, educators in, in the public schools. Um, we do free sports camps for about 8,000 kids. And we hire 200 high school kids as given their summer jobs coaching. And, you know, it's interesting, like these kids now make more coaching summer soccer than me and Manny <laughs> did as professionals <laughs> coaching when we started off. Um, um, I remember those days. And um, through that, though, we noticed the families. And so we do we do food um, and nutritional services. And we also renovated a community center on the east side of St. Paul. So really holistic. Um, you know, building the community and just focus on the well-being. And, you know, at the end of it, we're focusing on the kids, but then the surroundings. And that means their caregivers, their parents, um, and their seniors in the neighborhoods. So is this something say, that you knew you were, or sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Manny. No, I was just going to say, Kendra, one, one of the things I love about just observing it from afar is, is the adaptability of Tony's foundation to, to really deal with the stresses of the world and the stresses of our community. It, it, he, it, I, I, I'm always amazed at how when things come up and the community, community needs to step up, his organization steps in and really creates, whether it's food for people during COVID or whether it's an earthquake in Haiti, um, it really is, seems like it's, he's got something that's so adaptable to help the community. Well, and I remember, Tony, during um, COVID when, you know, parents were having to go back to work and people, kids weren't back in school yet. And I was visiting, I was at, at Conway. And I remember that, you know, you basically opened up the whole gym and had these like little study tables, partitions, like set up for kids to be able to come in. And I don't think there was no real requirement. There was no charge or no nothing. Kids, parents could just drop their kids off. They could get their homework done. They could work with some volunteer tutors and stuff during the day because that was such a challenging time for so many people on several different levels um and you just the mate the the ability as manny said to adapt and i kind of feel like that so many connections between sports and real life on the ability to adapt to change to pivot to you know figure out along the way what the needs are and what you need to get done to get there did you know this was something you always wanted to do? I mean, where did the the spark come from? Because a lot of times when we're young, we're not thinking that much about other people. But is there something that you always wanted to do? Well, I, you know, I don't know if, you know, like my mom was a social worker. Manny's mom was a social worker. Um, so we grew up kind of seeing people, you know, everybody knows Buzz, you know, like these are people that we had in our life that really, you know, took care of the community as a whole. So it wasn't necessarily like picking something to do. I guess it was following the direction of, of our elders. Um, you know, I talked to Jim Laudner. He was the Madison coach. And, mm -hmm. you know, a, a couple of years ago, and he goes, you remember when we had that talk? I'm like, what talk? He goes, well, after you left school, we sat down and he told me, he goes, I, you know, I'm disappointed you didn't come to Madison, um, but it's been an honor playing against you and seeing you grow as a person. And, what are you going to do with your life? And he said, I told them, well, if I can play soccer for five to seven years, buy a house, save a hundred thousand, and then I'll work with some kids the rest of my life, I'll think I'll be happy. And so, you know, did I plan it out exactly this way? But I think the spirit in this lived with me and, you know, kind of as a player, when people say, well, you know, what position are you? I'm like, well, what does the team need? I think this organization's built, um, to do one thing and that's to be responsive of the community needs. And so that's what changes, but our mission stays the same. 
Manny, to that point, when we talk so much about soccer in the community, the connection of people, it's really about bringing people together. Um, you know, Tony just said it really started with soccer, but it's more a, a means to connect with people, with kids, with the community. When you look at Minnesota United and maybe where it's at now, and I remember coaching Thunder Camps, which were out in the community, free camps in the summertime. So I I remember being a part of all that. But how do you see, envision soccer connecting to the community, not just to the Sana Foundation, but in general, not where it's at now, but how does it need to grow? How do we find a way to bring more people together and unite the community continuously, you know, and provide for some of these kids and these families' these experiences? Yeah, I, I, I'm really excited about what the next five to 15 years looks like for soccer in Minnesota. I, I certainly think, um, you know, I, I tell the story about the stadium being built and, and just these owners that believed in the sport, believed that soccer needed to be part about this global game and story. And I, I think it, a lot of it had to do with, with people in the 70s and 80s and 90s that were so dedicated to keeping soccer going when there was no pro league or an indoor league or you know, really pushing uh, women's soccer and girls' soccer and pushing um, to try to keep soccer, you know, growing and relevant. And I, I think that's why we have a, a beautiful stadium. I also think um, the work that Tony's done o- over uh, a great period of time now and the foundation of what United's trying to do and hopefully sparks uh, a base that we can build something special. And And again, something's already there. Uh, but I do think this next growth curve is so exciting. I mean, if you're talking about my perspective of Minnesota United and thinking about uh, young Minnesotans on Allianz Field, I 100% believe that's going to happen over the next five or 15 years on a consistent basis because of the base of work. Um, having said that, the, the work has to happen. You know, there has to now be an excitement to push that spark uh, to very similar to how high school basketball, I think, has done a great job of elevating their level to have uh, top talents go to become number one draft picks in the NBA. Um, I think that's the next phase for us is to use this, this great base that people have worked so hard, combine it, combine the work that Tony's doing, combining the work that, you know, this is a, a community that still needs to figure out how it, it can really raise everybody up and allow uh, opportunities for everybody so that everybody, every kid is not only having a great soccer experience where they become a leader or not, and then certainly my selfish side is excited about uh, that elite channel because I, I know via the work of Tony of so many organizations and Minnesota United, that's only be part of that spark uh, that has a lot more Minnesotans uh, playing on Allianz Field. Tony, you mentioned that one of the biggest things is not just about soccer, but about the relationships. When you deal and, and connect with these different families or the people that work in your organization, the people that volunteer at your organization, What's one of your biggest takeaways from the the connections? Like, do you have a story, a moment, like an aha? I'm sure you've got a thousand, you know, of something that's just like really like, you're like, yes, this is why I do this. This is why I get up every day and do what I do and put the time, the energy. Like, is there any moments like that? You know, I think sometimes it's just walking into the center and having kids come up and try to give you high fives and hugs. Sometimes it's hearing grandparents just say, you know, thank you when you come in the building and they recognize, you know, that that you're you're a part of this. Um, you know, I, I think more recently, you know, I've seen some of the younger kids that that worked here. You know, one of them is getting his master's in architecture. Um, and, you know, he just called me to have lunch, you know, even though he left here four or five years ago. And you 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 know that like even though you're not necessarily keeping a score that these little acts are having a trickle down effect and 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 you're really affecting people and creating spaces where there, where people are enjoying themselves so um you know i like to see people happy um and so i would think like that's part of the culture and and making sure you you provide a space where people like enjoy themselves and and have fun and you both have played all over the U.S. Clearly, all over the United States, played at the highest level. When you look at how, and I just talked to Colette about this last week, the new chief soccer officer, because of his upbringing and where he's been in his life, and Lebanese and Czech, and fleeing a war, and growing up in Sweden, and just like the power of um, soccer. You can be in the middle of Africa, and you know, he said somebody was wearing a Manchester City 
jersey and and you start this conversation or you throw out a ball and it's like it's like this connecting piece how often do you see that tony where where you're at that in, in some of these different communities that it doesn't take much to put a smile on the kid's face to get somebody wanting to participate to bring people together maybe kids over here and kids over here that would never normally connect and it's like a, it is truly a force of being able to bring people together through a, this this game yeah, you you would be surprised, you know, how segregated, you know, things are, but, you know, soccer, you know, really opens up and we, you know, we had a really cool, you know, MLK tournament, we brought kids from like 12 teams, and then we had a draft so you couldn't have any more than two players from the same team on on the new teams right. Mm. And so you saw like different schools or different, you know, demographic groups all, you know, learning to this big hodgepodge and um, and even now in the space at Conway, you know, you, we, we see the Korean kids with the Somali kids, with the African-American kids and the Latino kids all kind of playing together. Um, and the soccer is what's kind of that glue that's keeping them there. And the friendships are extending outside the field. So, you know, that's where it starts and then it, it will, it grows. Manny, yeah, Manny, just, we'll, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was... No, Kendra, go ahead. No, no, Go. You're good. No, I just extend Tony's talk about, the, you know, the community and he talked about the community clinics and I think about MNUFC and, and you know, um, just getting people through soccer excited to come together. Um, and, you know, you think about some of the mini pitches that we've built and, and Blue Cross and Beals, Blue Shield of Minnesota uh, has helped us with some of our pitch renovations, park renovations. Um, you know, there, there's futsal stuff. And, and really, like I said, Tony mentioned the Conway Center. And he, he's created this um, arc where he's he's got the whole community, but he also has a, a home base that kids can go to and feel at home. And again, I, I still think we're only tapping to the surface of of, of real di tough discussions about how do we make this community better and how do we give access for all. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, these two organizations, I think at their core, know that that it's vital not only for the experience of the kids, but also for the organizations to, to adhere to their mission statements and have a purpose and value every day. So I, I really like that. And I think I'd encourage anybody to go to Tony's website, look at what he's done in the past. And again, it's bigger than just the Conway Center he's at, but it is an amazing facility. Um, you know, we've, we've had some good moments, he and I, this fall together, we coached, uh, you know, a high school all-star game. So um, that type of, of energy. And again, like I said, we've, we've had some great mini pitch openings. Um, like I'm a little selfish too. I think we need to have way more inner city pitches and pitches that are smaller for kids to just start in a small field as opposed to just being thrown out on a big field. So there's a lot of little things that are there from a development side, but from the community side, um, it's just in a really exciting future about where things are going. You don't have to wait for spring to start playing the beautiful game. Starting in February, Minnesota United has a full slate of academy and youth camps scheduled throughout 2024. Show off your skills, take your game to the next level, and enjoy some quality time on the field with MNUFC's licensed academy staff. Visit the Camps and Combines page on MNUFC.com for more information. When you guys look at sort of we we started out the conversation where it started and where it's going. Everyone posts these picture these days. And you you know, if you had to put, you know, um look back at your yearbook, right? Your high school yearbook. And people used to say like most likely to do this, most likely to do that, goofy one, you know, comedian, whatever, whatever. What would what, what would it say under your picture now for each of you? What would it what would the description be if you had to give it to yourself or give it to each other? This could be interesting. You were when we were in high school? Well, like what would it be now? I mean, I'd be curious to know what you said in high school if you remember. I we we were pretty big soccer geeks, Kendra. We we <laughs> loved it. I mean, I, I always tell the story. Um, and again, I'm gonna sound like the old guy, but we 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 went to school, we had free periods. And Tony and I wanted to try to head juggle a thousand times back and forth. And we spent three or four months. I don't think we got to 771 times. You know, it, it takes over an hour to do that. Um, and I, I think 
from very early, we we you know used each other for a love of soccer and basketball, by the way, uh, and enjoying life together. So it was a it was it was pretty early on that that we had a big love for this sport and for sports in general together. I think people probably would have said we're most likely to play soccer. Yeah. Um, you know, that's maybe really, basketball. You know, I guess maybe. I, yeah, <laughs> maybe. But uh, yeah, you know, it was it was in our in our blood. And, you know, I had lunch with somebody the other day and, you know, they asked a, a question like when we had our first drink. And, you know, I'm like, well, we didn't really drink in high school. And people were like, that's different than kids these days. I'm like, we were just kind of dedicated to doing other things. And that wasn't like that was getting in the way of our, our goals at the time. Um, and so we, you know, we, we played and I, like I said, it's not, it's not working if you love what you do. So we would play hours and hours and hours. And like I said, we would eat as fast as we could. Like we would get out of the lunchroom in 10 minutes. So we'd have 35 minutes left. We'd go change for gym and we'd go behind the building and just juggle with our heads. Um, so we could, you know, we, we would just do this every day. So, um, I think that's what it would have said. We're, we're most likely to play soccer. Okay. Yeah. So that's another aspect, right? Not just like most likely to play soccer, but the whole concept of like the willingness to work hard for something that you want. I mean, you both have to have been instilling that same sort of mentality, that message that, you know, to, to everyone that you come in contact with now, right. At this point in your life and whatever, the, whatever you're doing. Yeah. I, I think you, you've got to have a love and a passion. And, and again, Tony and I were very lucky to have each other to push each other and, and to enjoy it together. And I think, um, the balance of having love and passion and find other people that that are like-minded and, and want to push you and want to make you better and want to enjoy it. You know, the competition of, of our own uh, goals were, were also still to win. You know, we were very competitive. Uh, and that, I think, helped uh, kind of evolve into us being competitive lifelong for whatever we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're very competitive people. We're competitive on everything. Um, and we would we would play chess before soccer games, right? And yeah. and do a do a lot of different things. And um, but I like I keep going back. It's it wasn't ever hard work because we loved it. Um, and so you know, and I would say like early on, you know, I think the jury probably thought Manny worked a little harder than I did. Um, <laughs> I I you know I would I was the type that I would go and um, play on my own a lot um that, that was unseen and um and I grew really late so things were were challenging for me um but again you know I think it also helped having someone like Manny played at the national team much earlier and he would always come back and and he would say well you should be there um and you're better than most of these guys and and so that gave me the confidence that you know to, to keep going and knowing that you know that there was opportunities for me and you know, like going going to college with each other was also, I think it helped because we two young people arrived, um, and but you know, we were very good together. I'll say that right. And and you know, you grow up with somebody, you can read their minds, you know what they're gonna do. So we walked on campus, um, sort of you know as a duo. And you know, he was yeah, I could think high school player of the year. Um, but you know, I was I would say I was tagging along, but but together. We More were, than tag know, one, let's be honest. one plus one plus one was like four. Yeah. I should ask you guys that. How did you end up at UWM? I mean, I don't know, you know, people may not have heard as much about UWM and in UW Milwaukee uh, men's soccer as they had in these last two podcasts <laughs> after, um, you know, and, and there was some glory days there at UWM. So how did you guys, how did you end up there when you look at uh, how I, I soccer think, in this country goes? Yeah, I, I think it was an example of there weren't a lot of, high level soccer players going to high level D1 programs at the time. And UDOM at that time was, you know, they had Bob Gansler, who was the national team coach and the coach at DWM. Now, Brian Tompkins came on board when we were there, uh, but they had a nice history of uh, success and they had a, a national team coach, which I'm mean, again, full circle. We're going back now when the national team coach actually had to have another job uh, <laughs> to be the national team coach. It kind of shows you where us soccer was back then. And, you know, it really was a uh, either college team or, or post college team uh, in those late '80s, early '90s. So, um, I, I think it was just a great journey Tony and I did together, and we, you know, kind of were like all trying to figure it out, you know, and trying to figure out what was our best next step. And like I said, it was a it was a it was a really fun one to have 
somebody like him because there are a lot of pressures when you're a freshman and you're really highly rated like he and I both were. Um, and to kind of come into that and enjoy those that time together was really important. A little different story because from what I remember, I was all set to go to Madison and I had my dorm picked out and Manny <laughs> was all set to go to, you know, we thought he was going to go to Virginia and it was set up. And then, you know, I think Mr. Gansler kind of let the family know that you could still get on the national team through Milwaukee. And, you know, our <laughs> college counselors convinced my mom it was the same state school education system. And I think we looked at each other and said, you know, like, it's either going to like, it's going to be end of our career together. Or we can keep it going. And we kind of decided to keep it going. That's awesome. Um, Hey, so what's your biggest, best soccer memory? Each of you in your life. I, I mean, do you want to start, Tony, or on me to? Start. What's that? Go ahead. You go, Manny. Yeah. I my uh it it it's gotta be the 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 different journeys you have, really. I mean, I, I Tony and I talk about our, our our high school memories and they're just ingrained. I mean, it was a time when we were still so innocent and learning it, and we, we still have so many great memories uh together and then um, I certainly, um, for me would be the Olympics. Um, certainly there's a young, young player there. Uh, and then certainly winning championships is always super memorable. And I guess for me then as a coach winning championships. So, um, I don't have one, but, but it's just the kind of nice look and, and maybe even the injuries. I kind of had this tough injury career where I always had to bounce back and become a little bit different person. So I think that kind of elements there too. So not one memory, but but really great memories, but mostly because there's a lot of adversity within it uh, to make it special. You know, I have one's a win and one's a loss, but like in the World Cup, just getting the national anthem and like realizing that you made it um, was was pretty special for me. And and you're just like, okay, you're dreaming of this, and like, you know, the whole time you're not you're not going to get hurt, you're not going to get hurt, and then you're there. <laughs> and then the other one was, you know, when we were like. I think 18, we played in the Dallas cup and we lost to this team. And I remember, you know, and, you know, we had a team and which all of our team was great, but I remember like that a couple of us were a little different. And I remember looking at, we played against like literally like UCLA's like starting team. And we were, you know, all high school players and me and Manny, and most of our team was, you know, um, you know, D three players. And, um we we end up losing and kind of getting unlucky but we played so well and I just remember thinking like we're really good like, <laughs> we are really good and like this is like if this is the best then like we're we're gonna get there um I, I so love that, that story like a, a real a real a special memory and even though we we lost but it was we knew at that point that we were gonna we were gonna make it I I love that story Tony and Kendra to give some context the Dallas Cup at the time became one of the biggest youth soccer tournaments in this hemisphere. Um, this was teams from South America, Central America, and obviously the U S and, and the team Tony's talking about was essentially uh, the U 23 national team at the time. And this is a bunch of kids from Minnesota, you know, kind of leaving our, our Island and seeing where we were at. And um, it, it is relevant because it, it does remind me that Minnesota can become a great development market and it can become a great market for soccer. And it always has, and it has its, its pieces, but again, it gets me excited when I hear that story because it really is about leaving the Island and showing that uh, we're a special place and that we can produce special players. And, you know, that's aspirationally. Um, I think that's the next iteration of United really is to get that spark going um, to, to find more special players to, to go out and leave the Island and do well. Isn't it crazy when you look back at your life in youth soccer? I just ran into someone at a restaurant last night and she pulls out this picture because St. Croix just had like our 40th anniversary of us, like a bunch of us standing in front of the net in corner kick, you know, some <laughs> team photo. We all have this like terrible hair and, you know, you just like look back at these memories of like these different iterations through soccer in Minnesota. Um, and oh, like those are your lifelong friends. 
Those yeah. are those people that you stay connected to forever. It's crazy. No matter where everybody moves and what everybody does, you always have these connections that keep coming back to soccer in, in some way, shape, or form. So I, I can appreciate that. And hence why you two are sitting here on the podcast still talking about the same passion, the same love for the same things in the same community. I mean, you could have gone and done it anywhere. But there's something special about being in Minnesota and doing it. It's no different when they came to me with the job initially for Minnesota United when it went to MLS. There is something very different coming back and doing it in your community where you have a connection and you feel a real sense of, you know, um, togetherness doing it where you grew up. It wouldn't be the same if you did it anywhere else. Am I right? Right. Um, go ahead, Tony. Home is home. <laughs> Always home. Yeah. Minnesota. Everybody comes back to Minnesota at some point. <laughs> I love that you th threw out a corner kick shout. That was another oh, stop. I miss, I miss corner out. kick. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> for sure. That should be another podcast. Maybe we need indoor soccer to come back and hit up the walls more. Yeah. With I the board. I was, I was cleaning out my garage Lito, and I found our Christmas cup. It was like a 1980 Christmas cup. Um, love it. Trophy. <laughs> we we got together and we decided that we were going to coach ourselves one year because Mr. Lagos couldn't coach us because it was high school. So we entered like this tournament just as, as our neighborhood kids players. And I think we renamed ourselves and bought t-shirts or something. I think you're right. Yeah. That was our shirts or t-shirts. <laughs> those, those are sometimes the best ones too. When you don't have a coach, you just go out there and you get to a point where you're just going out there and playing. Um, I want to ask you both too, like what is, what is next for each of you in, in your space? What, what needs to happen for um, the Sana Foundation to take the next step? What's your next vision? What's your next? I'm sure you have these short-term goals, long-term goals, dreams, aspirations of what you want, what you want it to look like. I believe you have your big event coming up here shortly, don't you? Gala for... Gala for goals, yeah. Gala for goals. I just saw a billboard for it the other day. Yeah. I know yeah. it's coming up here. Yeah, unfortunately, it's on opening day, um, so that's a little bit of a, it gets it gets there some days, but um, yeah, it'll be a great event, and you know, I hope that you know, really, the legacy is that what our programming is institutionalized, you know, um, and kids have these opportunities, and it doesn't, you know, it's not relying on me. So um, as I fade away, you know, I hope that you know this organization is still this big, and in twenty years from now, and um, you know, we're doing some stuff with U.S. soccer and MLS next um, across the country and, you know, really to provide a better atmosphere for kids to play in. Um, I hope we can leave, leave a lasting legacy there as well. I, I have to pipe in. Tony's being humble here. Again, the, the, the real work they do is not the Gala. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. the, the the real work is done in this community every day they wake up and the, their commitment is to, to, you know, help this community. But my outside perspective is this gala is amazing. I mean, I, I can truly tell you that um, the Party. pride of people who've been involved in the community in soccer, the pride of now the political community that knows they need to participate because they know how important the foundation is, the community, and, and just the energy there uh, is awesome. I mean, it really is, um, to me, one of the coolest galas, and I I've ever been to and get to go to. Um, I have to say one of the, my favorite parts that every time I've been is the kids performing on the stage. Yeah, I mean, there's. I, I, yeah. I, I just, all of it to me is an example of, 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 of a celebration of, of the work of the foundation. And I, I just, again, love that the people in this community want to go to this gala because they know how important that the foundation has been to the community. They want to celebrate it. And, and certainly Tony does a great job, obviously, using that to always create a great vibe for fundraising and, and making sure people um, hopefully can, can, you know, uh, donate and uh, be a part of it through the gala as well. So I think Tony, Tony's been a little humble there uh, with this gala. It really is an impressive event um, for sure. What I want to say um, it, it's fun seeing, I, I do. I love seeing the kids. I mean, there's like nothing about the kids on that stage performing um, every time I've been the whole thing, the auction items, the, I mean, people are like dressed to the nines. It gives people every a, a fabulous reason to go out and enjoy, but um, be giving money and donating money and participating in a, in a tremendous cause. And that's a huge event, but um, just as awesome is showing up at the Conway Community Center and other um, places where you do food distribution and donations. And I mean, we could go down the list, seeing groups of um, kids and families at Minnesota United Games at Allianz Field. So um, it's been awesome to see. I, I, I wish we could do a, 
We'll have to do a whole nother podcast at some point. We'll do some more breakdown maybe on the men's national team coming up in this next cycle. We'll do a few more coming into the uh, 2026 World Cup because I know it was just over a year ago now that we were at Allianz Field hosting those pregame shows for the World Cup when it was in November um, and the three of us were doing some shows. So we'll have to get back on the soccer train one of these days. We do. And I, I do want to put Tony on the spot. We do have to figure out the gala not to be on our home opener because it is a big one. In Austin. <laughs> so we've got to navigate that. That should be, uh, you know, well, how far in advance, advance, Tony, do you have to pick the date for the gala? Uh, pretty early, but I mean, the good news is at least it's an away game. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> <laughs> that's true austin uh yeah that's true it's not the home opener which everybody knows is march 2nd it's an afternoon game against the defending champions a little return of somebody named christian ramirez who has a nice tattoo of the mls cup on his calf i hear so <laughs> all right you know, what are you gonna like do that. yeah well thank you both for taking the time i should say too there is another clinic coming up it's a tc winter solstice futsal clinic that's coming up um that I think is just another awesome way Minnesota United is going to be involved with it, but another one of those places in the community that is just super, um, you know, important in what these kids and getting these kids to be out and do different things and be a part of it. So thank you both for taking the time. I appreciate you joining me. I know you have a lot going on. Uh, Manny, I'll get you in a tie next time so we can <laughs> we can live up to the level of Tony's uh, classiness on these podcasts. Thank you, Kendra. Well, everybody, that's it for this week's episode of Sound of the Loon. Stay tuned next week for another episode as Minnesota United continues their preseason, getting ready for the season opener on February 24th.